last service people ran out of the building with their hair on fire. So I want you to put your seatbelt on. We need to start installing seatbelts, I think, on our, on our seats here. Uh, because it's pretty intense. I got to tell you, Paul rolls, up his, Paul rolls up his sleeve. And he gives the Corinthian church a wallop, man. And the part that's pretty terrifying is what he calls them out on. It's been happening for 2,000 years, and longer for that matter. It happens today. Some of the stuff he's going to call the Corinthian church on, it's, it's happening maybe in your life. So you know how the first nine verses were really kind of sweet? He was saying, I just think you guys are amazing. I think about you all the time. I love you. You're the church at Corinth. Your salvation is secure in heaven. God loves you, and you're well-positioned as a believer. You're my brethren, he called them. And now that he's laid that foundation down, he does what any good instructor, any good father, any good pastor does. He builds them up in their position, and then he exposes, reveals to them the area that they're off in, and it's huge. And so I want you to be thinking this morning, this is a very dangerous message for this reason. You're not going to want to hear it, but you got to hear it. The temptation for you to ignore it's going to be high, it's going to be great. But if you do that, you're only damaging yourself. And you don't want to do that. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 10, we pick it up where we left off. Follow along with me if you would. This is what Paul says to them now. In fact, he makes that opening declaration now. The word in Greek, it's a, a snapping of the finger. All right, here we go. He says, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the authority of Jesus Christ. I'm talking to you. He says that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Verse 11, For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. Verse 17, this is the awesome punch. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. You say, what is he talking about? Well, first of all, set this in your mind. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, in fact, he's brought the disciples together in Matthew chapter 16. You don't need to turn there. You can write it down in your reference, in your notes. In Matthew 16, Jesus takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. It's in northern Israel today. It's a beautiful place. And he begins to speak to them. And I want you to look at the screens right now. And you guys just hold that image up on the screen for a moment. As Jesus was with his disciples, he takes them to this region that many of you have been with me on. We've toured this area. Now, this is a modern day sketch of an ancient sketch from the day, 2,000 years ago. So this is a sketch of a sketch. <laughs> but... We know from archaeological discovery, you'll see soon, you see those temples? In fact, as you're looking at these temples, go to the right of the screen. See how that, those trees slope upward? There's a vantage point right there. It's a, it's a hill. Jesus would have taken his disciples, because it's the only vantage point, on the hill. And they gather together, and he asks them a question. He says to them, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're the prophet. Some say, and then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? Stop right there. See this location? 
Each of these temples, now some of them have outdoor worship. Let's look, um, you see the two, obviously the two big stone temples. Look in between, you see that, that arch or that niche that's cut into the rock? You see those people and statues gather around on that platform? That was an area of worship. And you would put your God in that niche. Do you see the hillside? There's all these other little carvings, these niches. You would put your God there and you'd go through your worship of your pagan or foreign statue, of your foreign God. And the temples are numerous. There's one to the far right. Do you see what looks like a fountain? That is the temple of the nymphs. You know, nymphomania? A nymphomaniac is a sex addict. That's where the sex at the pornographers of the day, that's where they would go. You would hire a temple prostitute in honor of the god or goddesses, or, and you would go through those things that I can't talk about now, all under the guise of religious worship. How convenient is that? Well, listen, people today are still going to the altar of their computer regarding that kind of stuff. Okay, and so there's various things going on. This is a mall of pagan worship. It is an agora of paganism. But do you see the large, big hole behind the one temple there? Okay, keep that picture in your mind now. Next slide, you guys. The, the niche that was between the two temples, I'm standing inside that niche. The church is gathered around. Do you look, look to the far right where that one gentleman is standing? Do you see the niche above his head? Some of those images that we saw in the, in the rendering earlier. Next slide. Check this out. Okay, to the far, or to, I should say, the center of the uh, screen. That's that big, large area. Why is that important? That's where the headwaters of the Jordan River come out. Why is that important? Next slide. Because what would happen in worship, you would take your child, your firstborn baby, or an animal, if you didn't have a baby, and you would go through your worship, and you would cast the life of that animal or that child into that rocky, craggy pit where the water is gushing out. And if blood came out, then the gods rejected your sacrifice. You were in big trouble. If no blood came out, and in the turbulence of the water, you say, well, that doesn't look turbulent now. That's because about six, seven feet below that spot, the Jordan River is gushing out of the ground beneath. The geology has changed since. And so you would throw your sacrifice in there in your act of worship. Next slide, or is that it? I don't remember. That's it. All in pagan worship. Why is that important? Because during the time of Christ, that was the center. That was the place of bizarre, new age, radical thinking, which was mating with ancient Babylonianism. The worship of the 360 gods of the ancient Babylonian world. They're all represented there. Why is it important? Because Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Because when you went to that worship moment, you would say, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And you would go through your act of worshiping Diana. If it was Zeus, you would proclaim Zeus as God. Hey, by the way, they had another saying. You guys all know it. It's Caesar is Lord. Remember that? You either declare that Jesus was Lord, and if you did, you put yourself right immediately at odds with Caesar. Emperor worship. So you would state the name of your God and you would worship. Now do you see why Jesus on the hill say, who do you guys say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed that unto you, Peter, but my father which is in heaven. And I say unto you, Petros, pebble. Peter's name means pebble. P little piece of rock. Upon this Petra, I will build my church. Petra is a massive rock. You say, well, wait a minute. Jesus, there never was a church built on that site. Hang on. He goes on to say, upon this rock, pebbles, I will build my church and the gates of what? Hell shall not prevail against it. The Jews called that location, that pit, that hole, the gate of hell. And the associated areas of worship, the gates of hell. So Jesus used the modern statement of the day to say, 
when I build my church upon the fact that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I'm going to tell you something right now. The very gates of hell will not prevail against my church. That had to give them goosebumps and cause them to maybe jump up and down. Ladies and gentlemen, that truth of Jesus is still true today and will forever be true. Have churches started and failed? Yes. Those that were not of God? Those that got their eyes off of God? Yes. Local churches start and fail everywhere around the world. But the church of Christ, God, will never fail in the earth. There will always be what we would say the remnant. Yes? There will always be His people. There always have been. There always will be. So if an earthquake were to... I know we wouldn't have an earthquake, would we? (laughs) If an earthquake knocked this building down, it has nothing to do with, oh, look, the gates of hell prevailed against the church. That's not what it means. The church is gathered together based upon the fact that Jesus Christ is the Lord and the gates of hell cannot defeat that. Why is that important? Because in 1 Corinthians, it was a church flirting with disaster. And you're going to be quite surprised about how that disaster was about to come about and how prevalent it is today. Point number one, as we look at this, actually we should just read it, huh? He goes on to say, look at me, look with me in verse, um, well, look at verse, thir- look at Matthew, Matthew 16, 13, we just read he's in the area of Caesarea Philippi, and that area is described there in your head. Point number one, look at verse 10. Mark it down. One church under God is what we want to be considering today. One church under God. And here's the cool part. It's not us here today only. It's the believers, the true believers in the world collectively. Watch this. Number one, verse 10. A united church will have the same Lord. Will you mark that down? This is going to sound almost silly, but the Lord is concerned about, you're going to hear Paul speaking, about us being united. The church at Corinth was divided. So the thing we want to realize is a united church will have the same Lord. And you might be thinking, well, Jack, doesn't every church have the same Lord? Not necessarily. Maybe in verbiage, maybe in statement, but not in action. And that's the problem. That's the danger. There is this that's going on. In verse 10, we're united in obedience. And I want you to mark that down. When Paul says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the word name means the authority. And Paul evokes something very powerful. The Lord, it is Jesus who is the Christ. Meaning that nobody at Corinth has the Messiahship. Nobody at Corinth can create another Jesus. Nobody at Corinth is the Lord. It's the Lord only, and that's very exclusive. So he first of all says, listen, you guys, it's by this. It's by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ I'm speaking to you. Notice this, that he calls them brethren. Even though they're off track, Paul says to them, you are my brothers. But I want you to mark that word, plead. This is an amazing word. In English, we read it here because the context demands it. It's pretty spectacular. We say plead, but the word in Greek is parakaleo, and it means this, to call you near. It means to invite you over. It means to have you stand with me. If I'm going to parakaleo you, I'm asking you to join with me. I'm inviting you to go with me, or to be with me, or to stand with me. That's amazing and powerful. Why? Because here is Paul talking to a church that you would think this is already a settled, settled issue that Jesus is Lord. If you were to interview somebody at Corinth, they would say, Jesus is Lord. But their conduct was altogether different. So when he says, I plead with you, parakaleo, that word is also used by Jesus in John 16, verse 7. He says, nevertheless, Jesus does, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away or go back to heaven. For if I do not go away, the parakaleo, the helper, the comforter will not come to you, the Holy Spirit. So we know something. Paul is acting in the place or as a tool of God, pleading with them in the manner of the words of Jesus and the Holy Spirit as a comforter. But guess what? 
That same exact word appears again, parakaleo, in 1 John 2, 1. John writes there, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have a parakaleo, an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. This is amazing. Because when he invites them near, he's saying, come over here. I am going to both comfort you and I'm going to argue your case. Advocate, legal term, yes, but comforter, yes, a term of endearment. Paul is saying, join me in a united way under the authority of Jesus Christ. And that's the challenge to all of us today, to join a church, not any church, not some church, join the church which is universal in the earth by faith in Jesus Christ. I know you might be a member of some church. This is the Calvary Chapel. There's people here from all kinds of churches. But you must understand something. You'll see it strongly as Paul gets into this. You cannot think for a moment that that has any sway with God. It might impress some people. Well, I've been a member of a certain church for 40 years. Who cares? It doesn't matter. What's down deep in the heart? Doesn't matter what you say. Doesn't matter what kind of card you have to say that you were a member. What's in the heart? Who do you know? Do you know Christ personally? How is your walk with God? Is it for real? Is it passionate? Is it hot for the things of God? The Corinthian church had all of the right answers, but they were acting differently. And that's a dangerous thing. Obedience to God. Number two, fellowship. We're united by fellowship. He says, and he goes on in verse 10, number one here in verse 10, he says that you all speak the same thing. You ought to circle the word thing. We're going to find out, well, what's the same thing? Paul, what do you want us to say? What do you want us to be thinking, believing, speaking? Speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, no cliques, no little groups, but that you be perfectly joined together. The word perfectly joined together is one word and it means to be setting the bone back in place. It's a medical term to set the bone. It implies a bone is broken. That's interesting because the word division means to separate or to break the bone. So look at that again, verse 10. I want you guys to speak the same thing. Why? Because you know what? There's divisions. Your bones, as a church, your bones are broken. Hey, if you ever had a broken uh, broken bone, um, I had a broken finger. I never got it fixed. See how crooked it is? I was playing in the snow and broke it. And I figured most of the pain was over, so why would I go to the doctor to have him hurt me more? And uh, I don't do anything with that particular finger, so I left it alone. And it, it, it dried all wrong and messed up. It wasn't set right. Jesus... As a shepherd of us, a shepherd over sheep, I've told you before in John's gospel, if there was a sheep, if there was a lamb of the shepherds that was wandering away, listen, God does this. If you're a believer today, if you're, if you're not a believer, he will not do this to you. But if you are a believer and you wander away from God and you have a tendency to keep wandering from God, do you know what he does? He does what every shepherd does to a wandering lamb that he owns. He takes the lamb... <laughs> Let me pause right there. You've all seen the pictures of the shepherd walking on the hill and he's got the cute little lamb around his neck. You ever seen that picture? And you go, "Mm, that's so cute. You know that's a brutal picture. You want to know why? Shepherds don't carry sheep. Unless the shepherd has a reason. The shepherd would take that little lamb and he would put its little wandering hind leg stretch it out and put it between two rocks. He would take another rock or his rod predominantly. You know, the shepherd's staff and the rod. The staff was for gathering. The rod was for beating wolves and wild animals away. And the shepherd would take that rod and boom! And break that little leg. Oh yeah, you go, oh! (laughs) Better to be a lamb who learns its lesson than a shawarma in a pita. Why? Because the little lamb, now that its legs broke from its wanderings, it has to ride on the back of the shepherd's shoulders. 
And the little lamb begins to smell the shepherds, to uh, lick the shepherd's neck, know the shepherd's voice, feel the shepherd's pulse, knows everything about the shepherd. You learn everything about your shepherd when you come through hardship, when you come through difficulty, especially if you wander away and you're really a child of God, he'll come after you with a rod and he'll break your leg, so to speak. He might have to break your nose for some of you. And in your recovery process, you know the shepherd better than ever. And that's a very powerful thing to keep in mind. Why? Because when Paul is talking about the bone being set, sometimes the bone is set in such a way that it's, it's not done medically or it's not done professionally. And that little lamb will always limp. You see all the other little lambs way ahead of the shepherd? You'll see one lamb limping Behind the shepherd, just staying close to the shepherd. Remember Jacob in the Bible? He was a little stinker. What did God do? God wrestled with him one night and took his hip out. And for the rest of Jacob's life, he limped. He'll do that with us. He'll do that with us. Fellowship, though, is extremely important because without fellowship, we are broken. And Paul says, listen, we are united in fellowship. Speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you. By the way, that same thing is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. He says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ. That's one thing. The next thing is in verse 5, that you were enriched. That's the second thing. And everything by him in all utterance. That's the third thing. And in all knowledge. That's the fourth thing. Verses 4 and 5, we know what the thing is. The thing is, you've got something to say. You're not just saying something. You've got the Word of God to proclaim, church at Corinth. God has blessed you. He's given you all grace. You're His child. And so, keep this in mind. There should be no divisions among you. The Bible says in Psalm 133, verse 1, you all know it. I don't know why I'm saying things like that now. Did you hear what I just said? Why? It's wrong with me. I haven't been traveling. I haven't been down south. Y'all. I'm not even listening to anybody who talks like that. Y'all get me? Something's wrong somewhere. In Psalm 131, one, in Psalm 133, verse 1, Paul says, or the psalmist says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is, yeah, right? For the brethren to dwell together in unity you guys unity is hard work let's be honest hey those of you who are visiting for the first time don't listen to me right now but those of us who are in the family of god we don't get along we try we don't always get along that's how you can tell we're related we don't always get along in a marriage do you always get along you have to work at getting along. I think the table should be here. Lisa and I were cleaning the house this week. I think, I think the table should be here. I think it should be over here. But the, honestly, the answer should be, why should I care? <laughs> but we get ourselves involved in things that don't matter most of the time. And you think about that in, in, our, in our relationships as a church. Well, you know what? I don't like, I don't like these screens here. I don't, who cares? The young people put them up. I don't care. <laughs> How come you don't have a pulpit? You used to have a pulpit. You know what? I didn't like a pulpit because I felt like I was locked behind the pulpit. I want to be out here. You say, well, I don't like it. So I didn't ask you. <laughs> <laughs> Love you. Didn't ask you. I don't like the divi- I don't like the separation. I'd, I'd I'd rather be sitting down there, to be honest with you, personally. But can't do that, I guess. I don't know. Maybe we will. But it's interesting because Paul uses this word division, and it's much more serious. We get the word schism. You ever heard that word? That's a Greek word. You know Greek. It's schism. It means it's a there's a gap. There's a void. There's a rending of the garment or the breaking of the bone. When you have divisions among you as a church, you break the bone in the body. And think about churches all around the world that have broken bones because somebody just won't back off of an issue or they won't calm down about the color of the carpet or about this thing or that thing and they'll die on an anthill 
for something. When the kingdom of God is before us, the church is to be, and how beautiful it is that the brethren dwell together in unity, the church is to be an amazing powerhouse moving in the same direction. And that's a miracle. Let's agree, it's a miracle. I got to tell you, in a church this size, it is amazing because we can make an announcement about reaching some part of the world, and we can make an announcement about uh, saving babies from abortion. We can make the next announcement about uh, encouraging you to run for political office. And a church this size, you know how cool it is? We'll have 25 people for each item, issue. Yes, I'm signing up. And that's fantastic. But listen, each of them have a passion, and that's the body of Christ. The danger is, is when we be, become so confident, or I should say arrogant, that we begin to criticize one another's area of passion. Somebody might say, well, we're going go to we're go to the mission field. We're going to go to this part of the world. And somebody else who could care less will say, you know, I don't know why you're doing that. You should join me uh, with the Mexico construction team. Or whatever, or feeding the homeless in L.A. That's your thing. That's how the body comes together. You should celebrate those things rather than attack them. It's very, very important. Thirdly, it's this. We're united on a mission. A united church will have the same Lord in the sense that we are united on a mission. And he says in verse 10, near the end, he says, in the same mind, we're to be together in the same mind and in the same judgment. The mind is this. The word means the same understanding, the same feel. We would say, harmony. It's the same thought of mind. Not to create a bunch of robots, but to be thinking in the same vein of thought. How do we do that? Church, listen carefully. It is impossible for this church to accomplish anything for the glory of God unless we have a common mission. And that common mission, first of all, must be to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said that's the work of the Holy Spirit. He will exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, it's to preach the gospel here and to the ends of the earth. And that's, think about that declaration, Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 19. Think about that. If you are determined to do that, every one of us in this room says, I will obey God in this, and I'm going to do this very thing. Imagine this. That means that you are going to be concerned for your neighbor and some of you are going to be concerned about the man in the deepest, darkest jungles of South America. It all accomplishes the same thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's a common collective mission, and we're, we are united on that. How does that happen? Because we have the same Lord. Can someone say amen? It's the same Lord that we follow. More on that in a moment. Paul says to the church at Rome in chapter 12, verse 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Isn't this great? Think about it. Man, do we need this like never before. Everybody in this room should know enough Bible and get more and more Bible that we should be thinking the same way toward one another. And this is fun. It gets real quiet. Did you know in this church there are murderers who have done their time and they got out? In this room? Right now. How do you know, Pastor? Because I know. There are people in this room with past lives that if you knew, you would run. Hmm? What's funny is, if they knew about your past life, they would run. The early church was like this. There was a prostitute in one seat and an IRS agent in the other seat. We know this to be a fact. The Bible says that there were tax collectors Publicans and sinners, all in the same church. Think about that. Here's the cool part. We're to look at one another now with Jesus glasses on. That's how we look at each other. We have, we have, a, we have more police officers and, and agents that attend this church than probably most cities have as, as police officers and agents. And the world that they live in, that's a tough world because you know what? It's like a doctor. Who does, who does a doctor see? Sick people. If you're in law enforcement, who do you see? Lawbreakers, bad guys. In my calling, everybody's marriage is falling apart. 
and my calling? Every, every parent is saying their kid is not having sex with that other kid. Not my kid. Yeah, well, I got to tell you, she told us last week that she, you need to know. Not my kid. Oh, yeah. And you begin to think you can get tainted. And it's a very dangerous thing. So that everybody's bad or everybody's messing up or everybody, and as a Christian, you and I are to look at each other in Christ Jesus. We're to look at one another and expect the best, hope for the best, love them, put up with them, endure. Do that love thing on them. That's what he's called us to do, and frankly, that's what he does to us. It's pretty encouraging. But we're on mission, and that mission is to exalt Jesus Christ. Again, Paul writes to the church at Philippi, and he says in Philippians 2, 4, he says, let each one of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What a tremendous statement. Point number two is a united church will share the same vision. That's understandable. If we have the same Lord, we're going to be sharing the same vision. You say, what does vision mean? A lot of people talk about vision. Even companies today, they've used that. They've taken it from the church and they'll ask you, uh, if you go to, you're going to interview by a company, they're going to ask you something like this. What is your mission? Or you ask the company, what is the mission of this company? Where'd they get that from? They got it from the church. They might not use the word mission. They might use the word vision. What is the vision of this corporation? They got that from the church. Why? Because the church is supposed to have vision. But you can't have vision if you have division. No vision, no division. You have division, you ain't going to have any vision. Because you can't look above or beyond other people. You're focused on the problems. And the church at Corinth was focused on the other guy's problem, but nobody would focus on their own problem. You know the old saying, I don't know who said it, but you know, if you point at somebody, there's three fingers pointing back. Well, okay, but there's a lot of truth to that. I have found in my life, if you know someone who points out faults all the time, they got more faults than the faults they're pointing out in people. Have you noticed that? Hey, man, you know what? Oh, man. Well, a church united has a shared vision, and the vision is united for him. It's for his glory. Verse 11, for it has been declared, Paul says, it's been declared to me. That's a term, it's been revealed. There's evidence, it's overwhelming. You've been indicted, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. This word is quarrels, arguments, and fighting, bickering. They're split, the bones are broken as a church. They gossip and complain about others in the body of Christ. They argue, they debate, they strive. The word means to wrangle. I don't know. That sounds like a problem, doesn't it? Man, that guy's just wrangling on about that person's fault and this person's problem. And no, listen, our vision is united for him. Not to go after somebody. That's not our place. That's not our position. James tells us, listen to this verse. James tells us in chapter 4, verse 6, But he gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The word resist or resist the proud means to stick out the chest. You watch a football game, and you watch those linemen defend the quarterback, those guys are huge. That's the word. God resists the proud. Trust me, my friend, you need to to be humble because God's chest is bigger than your chest. He'll stick out the chest to withhold you. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Wow. Our vision is united for Jesus as a church. Listen, we need to stop thinking about what's in it for us. America, I don't know why as a culture, maybe because churches haven't done their jobs, I don't know. But we become so self-centered. What's in it for me? What do I get out of this? You guys, the world we're living in, everything's, 
watch, watch the, new, the commercials. Everything's about investment. Guard your investments. Did you invest in your home? Are you looking at your home as an investment? You shouldn't. Buy gold. Are you sick of that as I am? You hear that? That's the sound of gold. Can you see? These guys crack me up. And the Bible says in the last days, men will gather gold in order to prevent themselves against the last days. The Bible warns. Guess what you say? What's the deal? Well, pastor, what should I be buying? Read your Bible. Read your Bible. You should be buying wheat. The Bible says in the last days, you're not, you can't eat gold. And look at it. It's so cool. Well, try to eat it because the Bible says food's going to be the hot commodity. But everything's about gold. And it just cracks me up. Wait a minute. If my TV is warning me that we're in the last days, shouldn't it be all about Jesus and us getting the word out? And you can, you, listen, you can throw a thousand tons of gold on your neighbor's front yard. They're still going to hell without Jesus. He'll just be the richest guy in hell. That's all. Give them Jesus. Well, I don't, you know, I don't know. But these crazies are on TV. Gold, gold, you got to play gold, more gold. Like Daffy Duck and the little gold. Sheesh, if we were so passionate about Jesus. It's amazing to me. Also, this verse 12 teaches us that our vision is united around him. Oh boy, here's where Paul takes the gloves off. Ushers, lock the doors. Here we go. Paul says, verse 12, here's the problem. This is one of the cancers at Corinth. Now I say this, another Paul is saying, listen up. Each of you say, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Stop right there. Those are personality cults. This is not a good thing. You say, well, yeah, but what about the guys who say I'm of Christ? They're the worst of the whole bunch. Because this, you know what he's talking about? In one church in the city of Corinth in Greece, there was over here in this group, hey, we're of Paul. They had their little thing, Paul. We're the group of Paul. In this group, Apollos. Cephas is the Hebrew way of saying Peter. We're more legalistic than all the rest of you guys. We're really right on. Yeah, we're born again, but we keep the law. And then we're of Christ. The, one, the, the ones that were of Christ, they were the super saints at Corinth. They were not like any of those losers. We're super believers. <laughs> it sounds cute on paper. It's a bad deal. And you know what Paul says about that? He's, what he says about personality cults? They destroy churches. Listen, beware of any man or woman who tries to usurp authority over your life in a spiritual setting. When they have to tell you, I'm called by God to tell you. Church, listen. Have you ever had anybody come up and say, the Lord told me to tell you. Excuse me. See these? My heart's open. I love the Lord. He can tell me himself. Right? I'm not going to tell you this stuff I've heard from people. The Lord told me, I don't know why, Pastor, I got, I'm supposed to tell you this. But the Lord told me to tell you, and I can't even repeat the stuff I've heard. Listen, anybody usurping authority, they're breeding a personality cult. If anybody says, well, you know, you really can't make it without me, they are a cult. It's all about Jesus. It's all about this church here right now, this place, pointing you to Christ. God sees to it here. He makes me look like an idiot most of the time. Why? So that you look at Christ. You say, look at me, and it's like, what a whack nut. We need to follow Jesus. Keep your eyes. <laughs> but it's human nature. Listen. Oh, this is going to burn. Are you ready? Here it comes. When we're carnal and we have little faith, if any, we gravitate toward people. Even the church has its superstars, and it's an abomination to God. Pastors should not pull up, and servants of the Lord should not pull up in limousines with paparazzi flashbulbs 
and be escorted in on a red carpet. Is there a place to show respect, love, and honor? Yes, but to exalt a person is a personality cult. Oh, we're of Paul. That made him sick. And by the way, listen, I know some superstars in Christianity, and they're shocked to hear about themselves. They what? They, it's what? They printed this about me? Oh, I didn't know I was, wow. I'm impressed with me, and I know me, and I'm not impressed. <laughs> I love those guys. But then there's loonies who read their own propaganda and think there's something. Danger. The Bible warns us that in the last days, nuts will come. And they'll come out of the pulpit. Then they'll come around religious, spiritual gatherings. And they'll say, you know, follow me. I'll show you the real, real, super, super, only, only way. Watch out. Be careful. And so as they make these statements, it offends the Holy Spirit. Personality cults, things like this. I'm of Paul. Well, let me ask you this. What happens if Apollos showed up where Paul was supposed to be? I'm not going. It's Apollos. I'm like Paul. I'm going, forget it. You know that happens? You know that happens in every church? People will say, Pastor Jack, how come you never tell us when you're gone? <laughs> well, first of all, because I'm not stupid. And who's in here anyway? I could say I'm gone, and there could be some robber sitting in the church. He could go to my house. Why would I say, hey, I got the door unlocked. I'm going to be gone for a week. You don't say that thing. And another thing, the reason why you don't say it, some people, some people say, well, you're going to be gone next Sunday? I'm not going to be gone next Sunday. Oh, because if you're going to be gone next Sunday, I'm not going to come. Are you a Corinthian? Well, I don't really get much out of that other person. Stop looking at him and listen. It's the content, not the personality. Think about that for a moment. Well, you know, it's wrong. Who's going to speak? What? what? Who's in the conference? What? Forget who's in the conference. It's the content. It's what they're delivering. Well, I'm of Apollos. They were the brains, the intellects. I'm of Paul. He reaches the Gentiles. I like that. I'm of Cephas. I'm kind of legalistic, and Peter leans in my direction. I like him. Or I'm of Christ. I'm better than all you guys. Wow, that's dangerous, don't you think? Well, you know, Pastor, I'm just visiting here today because I'm, uh, you see, I'm an assembly of God. <laughs> well, just know this. The guy three feet from you, he's a Baptist. Think about if we, well, you know, what if we all had that attitude? It's Corinthian. Guess what? There ain't going to be any Calvary Chapel people in heaven. What? There, there ain't going to be, everybody runs out. No. There ain't going to be any Baptist, no Lutheran, no Methodist, no Assembly of God. There's going to be one people in the body of Christ who love and follow Jesus. Okay, outside of that, good luck. We're out of time. I think, are you guys playing tricks on the clock back there? I, I still have uh, numerous notes. Yikes. Let's pray. I can't. I, just, I, I can't. But listen, next week, um, I was just getting warmed up. <laughs> no, Father, we just ask of you, Father, right now, that as a body of believers, Father, this place may, uh, may be fairly decent in size. We've got a lot of seats. There's a lot of cement. Some glass back there. Outside of that, Father God, may this be, as it were, a simple gathering of people. If it, if it suits you better, Lord, on a hillside, then... To the hillside we shall go. But Father, in this gathering, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be focused on one thing only, and that is that Jesus would be our Lord 
And Lord, that being true, our obedience, our mission, our absolute commitment to you, Father, would be exemplified in how we live for you, how we are gathered around one another in your honor and your name. And Father, that as a group of believers, I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, that as we leave this place today, we would leave with this, that we are not to be divided. We are to love one another without title, without identification. We are to love one another because you love them. Father, please, we know it's your will. We're asking you collectively, Lord, to override any area of our lives that we have somehow reserved or protected for ourselves. We ask you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.